Right, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you for um, coming to uh, Resolution Foundation on a cold Friday morning, semi-early-ish. Um, but now I want to start with a very serious mere culpa. The, um, last week Andy Haldane decided um, that it was a good idea to say that the economics profession needed a serious dose of that introspection about our performance, possibly about our humanity, but definitely about our forecasts. The, um, we have apparently all been having a Michael Fish moment. We're not better at forecasting um, uh, than weathermen are at seeing storms. The, um, and so I've, I've taken that very seriously. We've gone and looked um, and checked. We've run all our models again. I've looked through the data twice overnight, and I just want to say... Hands up, honestly, we didn't see the, the uh, snow coming. We're sorry about that. It can't be fixed, and that's where we are. So, the, um, so that's life. Now, uh, the room is packed. Actually, it could have been twice over packed if we'd let everybody that wants to come today come. It is worse than a virgin train on a Jeremy Corbyn virgin uh, diary day. The, um, that's good. Now, why is it packed? The, um, uh, partly, obviously, because we're going to come on to some of our excellent speakers. But firstly, and particularly, why is it packed first thing in the morning on a cold day? There's a seat free at the front. I recommend sitting in it. This is going to be a serious morning. You don't want to be standing for all the slides we're about to show you, even if for some of them. The, um, so it's partly because it's busy and obviously partly because the media needs to calm down about snow. It turns out that planes, trains and automobiles can cope with the light dusting and you've all made it. That's good. The, um, it's partly because one of the hard lessons of economics over the last 15 years is that when we look for most people, the economy is basically the labour market. Because for most people, for all of our discussions about equities and anything else, exchange rates, all they really care about in the short term is the labour market, plus prices in the shops. So the labour market matters in economics more than we thought about, than we thought they were trying to predict about how people behave. But lastly, it's for one big difference, people, I think you're here, and that is because the big difference between economic forecasting and weather forecasting is that Michael Fish couldn't change the weather. The, um, the, uh, which is hopefully slightly blindingly obvious. The, um, whereas economic forecasters can. The, um, I'll give you an example. So an economic, particularly economic policymakers can. The, um, so if you, you, wouldn't, you don't have to be a currency trader for the last six months to think that Theresa May can change your business. She changed it quite a lot. Most government speeches nowadays involve a good movement in sterling. You may think that's a good or a bad thing, the, um, but it is happening. It happened last week. It happened most weeks since September. The, um, and actually, uh, at the last speech held at the Resolution Foundation by an MPC member, which was back in June, Martin Wheel, who Michael has replaced on the MPC, the um, uh, sterling... Uh, uh, strengthened on the back of that speech because he poured cold water on the idea of a stimulus, po post-Brexit stimulus. Now, the week after, he then said he supported a post-Brexit stimulus, so uh, Sterling then went down again, so any of you that were hoping to get some good news out of it didn't get to keep it. But my, my point is that whether men and economics forecasters and economics policymakers are not the same people or engaged in the same business, and maybe we'll come back to that later. Now, we've got the right panel to show you that um, economists are not weathermen and women here. They, um, so the main event today is Michael Saunders. Uh, he's going to give us a, a roughly a 30-minute speech taking you through some of his thinking about where the labour market is uh, at the moment. The, um, he is the market moving part of the panel, although the others are obviously exciting in their own way. The, um, and he's recently joined the um, Bank's Monetary Policy Committee. Before that, without going into all the details, largely to do doing economic work at Citigroup since 1990. That's a good stint. Just to show you that people do not all chop and change nowadays. Some people have high retention in their jobs. But anyway, responding to that, we're going to have Sarah O'Connor, who's the FT's employment correspondent. She does a good job of making labour economics sound human, even though lots of her writing is about robots. The, uh, Laura Gardner, on our, my right, uh, is a senior analyst at the Foundation. She's led a lot of our labour markets work over the last few years, in particular a big report on full employment last year. I recommend you all read it if you haven't. I'm sure you all have. There's some nodding. I don't believe you. The, uh, um, and she now leads a big intergenerational commission. I will come on to some of the things she's going to talk about. And Paul Gregg on the left is the Professor of Economics at Bath University. He's a member of every commission on the planet, including the Social Mobility and the Living Wage Commission. The, and he's a veteran of labour market policy, policy making since the mid-1990s. So he's to blame for most of what has happened since then. So, right, that is the order of play. Um, we'll have Michael's speech and then responses from the three panellists. And then we'll have about 45 minutes for questions from you. And it is cold in here, so you won't be able to fall asleep in the big comfy chairs. So hopefully we'll have a lively session. Michael. Thank you. Oh, careful, it's a dangerous place, life. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming along, and thanks for the 
the Resolution Foundation for hosting it. Uh, my talk today is going to be on the labour market, and in particular, the limited response of wage growth to falling unemployment. There will be loads of slides which are going to appear. Some of them will disappear quite quickly, and they will all be there on the bank's website, as well as a copy of my text. Now, at first glance, the labour market now not very attractive. Uh, the jobs rate is down to 4.8%, slightly below both the 2000 to 2007 average, and the MPC's estimate of the equilibrium rate, which was about 5%. The jobs rate has only been below current levels for a few months in the last 40 years. The short term job rate is the lowest since data began in 1992. The number of job vacancies is around a record high, and the ratio of unemployment to vacancies matches the 2005 low. However, even with relatively low unemployment, average weekly earnings growth remains modest at 2 to 3% year to year. Union labour cost growth is still perhaps slightly below the pace consistent with the inflation target over time, and there's little sign of significantly <coughs> higher pay growth for 2017. The labour market models used by most forecasters, which presumably are based on past behaviour, have not done well in explaining and forecasting the modest trend of pay growth. In recent years, pay growth has repeatedly undershot compared to consensus expectations, OECD forecasts and Bank of England forecasts. I show you here the consensus, I show you here the Bank of England's record, and I show you here the OECD's average forecast error in the last three years. The UK has the biggest undershoot compared to the OECD's forecasts of any country. Most forecasts have looked for the relation between the jobless rate and pay growth to return to, return to something like that seen before the 2008 to 09 recession, whereas in practice this relation seems to have shifted downwards again. Of course all forecasts are fallible, but such repeated and widespread forecast errors are interesting to me, because they hint that the underlying behaviour of wage growth has changed. This is also evident in figure 8, which shows you the gap between average pay growth in 2014 to 16 and projections based on simple wage Phillips curves, in other words, a regression of pay growth on the jobless rate, fitted over 2000 to 13 across OECD countries, and you can see the marked undershoot in the UK. I suspect the subdued, the subdued trend in wage growth in part reflects structural changes which these models may not fully capture, including greater labour market flexibility and insecurity, extra labour supply, increased underemployment, broader educational attainment, and changes to the tax and benefit system. These changes probably imply greater downward pressure on pay growth for any given jobless rate than previously. The Bank of England's estimate of the um, equilibrium jobless rate of 5% is based on a mix of empirical observation from the pre-crisis period, which is the last time the economy had a near zero output gap, time series an analysis, and the labour market search and matching framework. This search and matching framework consists of a beverage curve, which shows combinations of unemployment and vacancies for a particular level of search efficiency, and a job creation curve, which shows vacancy unemployment combinations of equal profit for firms. In this model, higher unemployment makes it more attractive for firms to create vacancies and hire people as the match rate is higher, but there are diminishing returns to creating vacancies as the jobless rate falls and the labour market becomes congested. The intersection of these lines is the equilibrium jobless rate. The gap between the actual jobless rate and its equilibrium is used as an input to a standard wage Phillips curve model with some role for inflation expectations. There was an apparent rightward shift, as you can see from the right hand chart, in the beverage curve from 2013 to 14, which suggested reduced labour market matching efficiency. Recent data bring us roughly back to the 2002 to 05 trends. Hence, assuming that the job creation curve has not shifted, one could infer that the natural jobless rate is about the same as in the pre-crisis period. One issue with this framework um, is that the derived natural jobless rate has a sizable margin of error, especially because the parameters of the job creation curve are poorly observed. And this also means that these models are quite slow to reflect, to reflect structural changes. And as Peter Diamond argues, the US beverage curve often shifts out as unemployment starts to fall, 
that these shifts have not been useful predictors of the job and strength of the economy attained at the end of subsequent expansions. In addition, the search and matching model aims to measure a long-run equilibrium. At any particular time, this may not necessarily be the same thing as the Nairo, which you define that loosely as the jobless rate consistent with on-target inflation, once shocks from the exchange rate and so forth have worked through. For example, increased labour supply might shift the Nairo for a period, especially if new labour market entries are hit differently to the existing pool of workers. Moreover, the search and matching model assumes that the level of vacancies is a consistent guide to labour market demand over time. This may not be valid. In particular, the costs of recruitment advertising have plunged, with the shift from paid ads in newspapers and magazines to internet-based ads. Advertising spend per job vacancy is down by 53% over the last five years and by 80% over the last 10 years. For firms who advertise vacancies through their own website, it's almost costless now to keep a job ad running for an extra month or two. The collapse in the cost of recruitment advertising may lift labour demand a little because the total hiring cost is lower than previously. But the more important effect may be to increase the number of recorded vacancies and reduce recruitment intensity. As firms become more picky in hiring, they're more likely to engage in what search theorists call speculative fishing. That is, firms may post more job vacancies and for longer, with more specialised requirements, with little expectation or intention that they will all be filled. Research in the US has identified this effect and suggests that it increases when the economy weakens or credit availability <coughs> worsens. As a result, we may see less observed cyclical variation in the official vacancy data and greater cyclicality in recruitment intensity. The same may be happening here, with a marked recent discrepancy between the vacancy data, which indicate very high labour demand, and surveys of firms hiring intentions, which suggest that labour demand is around average. Likewise, although the CBI reports the greatest skilled labour shortage in manufacturing since 1989, business surveys overall do not suggest that the labour market is the tightest in recent decades. Short-term changes in the number of vacancies probably remain a useful signal of whether labour demand is rising or falling. But a given level of vacancies may not signal as much labour demand or labour shortages as 10 or 15 years ago with lower and more variable recruitment intensity. This effect might well produce an apparent rightward shift in the beverage curve, even if there has been no underlying change in this relation, or it could disguise an underlying leftward shift in the beverage curve. It probably also could affect the job creation curve. All this would increase the likelihood of misleading signals from labour market stack measures based on the search and matching model. Two widely cited explanations for recent weakness in pay are low productivity growth and low headline inflation. If these views are valid, then pay growth might well be about to recover markedly, either because of higher inflation or higher productivity growth, even if the jobless rate is stable or rising. However, while these factors probably have played a role, I doubt they are the whole story. There is a close long-run link between real pay growth and productivity growth, but the causality in recent years has probably gone both ways. Low productivity growth has capped pay, but low pay growth, due to other factors, probably has lifted labour demand and lowered productivity growth via the substitution of labour for capital and the expansion of labour-intensive sectors with low average levels of pay and productivity. Hence, the UK has ended up with low pay growth, higher employment, and low productivity growth. By international standards, the recent slowdown in UK pay growth is far more exceptional than the productivity slowdown. UK productivity fell sharply in the 2008-09 crisis, but productivity growth over 2011-16 to has been similar to the OECD average of 0.6% year-to-year. The slowdown versus the pre-crisis pace of about one percentage point, also is similar to the OECD average. However, the slowdown in pay growth in the UK over 2011 to 16, down by three and a half percentage points compared to the pre-crisis trend, was roughly twice the OECD average. Hence, unit labour cost growth slowed far more in the UK than the OECD average, and indeed more than any other G7 country. Likewise, at a sectoral level, there is little link between weakness in productivity and pay growth. 
To be sure, with the UK's flexible labour markets, one would not expect sectoral differences in productivity growth to be fully reflected in sectoral variations in pay. But if the productivity slowdown is the main driver of weakness in pay, one might expect at least some link at a sectoral level, given that people cannot always move seamlessly between sectors. Moreover, unit labour cost growth, which roughly equals pay growth less productivity growth, has also undershot the bank's internal forecasts in recent years. By contrast, if weakness in pay just reflected a surprise productivity slowdown, one would expect higher unit labour cost growth, because wage growth would probably not respond one for one immediately to weaker productivity unless unemployment rises. Regarding the theory that low inflation caused low pay growth, I note that pay growth is undershot forecasts when inflation has been relatively high, as in 2011 to 12, and low, as in 2014 to 16. Moreover, it's hard to find statistical evidence for a consistent link from headline inflation to pay in recent years. I show you here various regressions that seek to explain private sector wage growth using unemployment, productivity, and inflation or inflation expectations. In equations fitted over 2001 to 10, inflation or inflation expectations do not really play much role and are jointly insignificant in statistical terms. And equations fitted over 2001 to 2010 all project that pay growth now should be above 3% year to year. Since 2011, inflation and expectations are jointly significant, but expectations consistently outperform the headline inflation rate. And if we use both headline inflation and inflation expectations in the same equation, the coefficients on headline inflation are either insignificant in statistical terms or negative. In other words, implying that lower headline inflation without a shift in inflation expectations would lift pay growth. To be sure, the results may differ slightly over other sub-periods, but that would tend to reinforce the point that there does not seem to have been a stable link from headline inflation to pay. The effect of the jobs rate appears more pronounced in recent years. I does not suggest that recent low inflation rate had zero bearing on pay growth, but their effect is probably embodied in inflation expectations, and since these are already included in forecasts, does not explain the surprise weakness in pay. The CIPD pay survey suggests that firms' ability or inability to pay more matters, uh, matters far more than headline inflation in determining pay growth. Of course, as with, with productivity, the causality may run both ways. Lack of wage pressure may have contributed to low inflation, particularly when weak wages have come as a surprise to policymakers. The structural changes in the labour market are too recent to allow a definitive estimate of the new equilibrium jobless rate. In any case, it may still be changing. Some of these factors might lower the natural jobless rate, but perhaps not easily fit in a search and matching model. Others may not permanently alter the natural jobless rate, but may reduce wage growth for a given jobless rate for a sustained period of time, perhaps well beyond our forecast horizon. And I want to discuss a few, a few of these factors. First of all, flexibility and insecurity. In the last five years, the numbers of people that are self-employed has risen by 14%, the number of agency workers is up about 30%, and the number of businesses registered in the UK is up by about 40%. There's also been the expansion of zero hours contracts and the gig economy. Among people in work, the proportion that are full-time employees, in other words, not self-employed, not part-time, not in a temporary job, remains well below pre-recession levels. Of course, some people may prefer flexible work structures or seek to reinvent their career through self-employment. But given that, on average, these less secure forms of work are also less well-paid, the expansion of contingent work probably also reflects the erosion of secure and well-paid jobs, driven by example from technological gains and greater emphasis on cost control. Another factor lifting job insecurity is that the costs of losing a job appear to have risen significantly. For example, there is tentative evidence that wage scarring, that is the adverse effects on someone's future pay levels from a spell of unemployment, has increased, at least initially. Using LFS microdata, I show you here the disparity in wage levels between people in work now but unemployed a year earlier, compared to those that were also in work a year earlier, controlling for other factors such as age, education, 
invade and convince you to hold the cup. <laughs> but I'll say, I'm sorry, give me a refill if you can trust me with that. <laughs> There's cause anything to go wrong. We'll see how we go. Um, controlling for age, education, gender, industry, occupation, and so forth. This wage gap was falling up to 2010, but has risen to about 11% on average from 2015 to 16, and over 12% in 2016. Moreover, the number of people receiving jobless benefits is now only about half the number unemployed, with far tougher application of work search tests. You better hang on to it. <laughs> <laughs> people deserve a second chance in the labour market and in water. Far tougher application of work search tests since 2010. By contrast, 20 years ago, the number receiving jobless benefits was equal to 80% of the number out of work. Reduced job security and the greater financial cost of unemployment may reduce workers' bargaining power and create higher risk aversion, making people more likely to settle for modest or no wage growth and continued employment, rather than push for higher wage growth if that comes with risks of job losses. <coughs> in addition, the tightening in criteria for benefit eligibility probably has also increased the pressure on the unemployed to get into work. The next factor is underemployment. The rise in part-time work also has been associated with more widespread underemployment. The ONS report that 8.4% of people in work would like and are available to work more hours. This includes both part-time and full-time workers and those willing to work more hours in an extra job. Unlike the unemployment rate, underemployment remains somewhat above the pre-crisis average, which was 6.7% over 2002-07. Moreover, one should also consider underemployment in terms of skills. The ONS reports that 47% of recent graduates are in non-graduate jobs, up from 37% in 2001. The next factor is education attainment. Uh, this, this has risen sharply in recent years. Since 2000, the share of the population aged 25 to 74 years with tertiary, that is university-level education, is up from 21% to 38%, while the share who did not complete secondary education is down from 27% to 20%. The share of people with tertiary education and the rise in this figure since 2000 are both among the highest of any EU country. Given that the UK's tertiary education rate among people aged 25 to 44 years exceeds 45%, the overall tertiary education rate will rise further in coming years due to cohort effects, even if the numbers entering tertiary education now stabilises. This matters because on average people with tertiary education, so I shouldn't go forward, there we go, uh, people with tertiary education are far less likely to be unemployed than people with low educational attainment. Over 1992 to, 20, to 2015, the jobless rate among people with tertiary education in the UK on average was 5 to 6 percentage points, below that for people who did not finish secondary education. The graduate pay premium has shrunk in recent years, but the gap in jobless rates has been roughly stable. Moreover, jobless rates among the less educated are far more cyclical than among those with better education. The marked broadening in education and attainments over recent years should therefore imply a lower structural jobless rate. As the overall population becomes more adaptable to change and employable across a range of areas. As a rough estimate of this effect, if we freeze the jobless rate by education attainment at the 2000 average and then track forward the change in education attainment since then, the jobless rate now should be roughly one percentage point below the 2000 level. Next factor is the rising participation rate. The bound between workforce participation and inactivity is proving much more flexible than previously. The participation rate among people aged 16 to 64 years is up from 76.6% in 2011 to 783 close to the record high, while participation among, among people aged 65 to 74 years is up from 14.4 to 17.1%. As a result, workforce growth has averaged 0.9% year to year from the start of 2011, far above the growth in the working age population, which has been just 0.2% year to year. In recent years, more people moved into work from inactivity than from unemployment. This implies that potential labour supply exceeds the unemployed. It also includes people who are currently outside the official workforce statistics, 
but likely to join the workforce in coming quarters and move directly into employment. Various factors are lifting participation rates, including rising life expectancy and improved health, rising female retirement age and technological gains that facilitate flexible work. The expansion of in-work tax credits has greatly increased the rewards from being in work, even if low paid, especially for people with children. Increased educational attainment also is a factor, especially the drop in the numbers of people who did not complete secondary education. You trust me with the water. I'm just about to add. Participation rates are much lower for people with low education attainment, and as the numbers in this category fall, participation rates naturally rise. This fact alone can account for much of the observed rise in parking much of the observed rise in, particip in participation rates for the 20 to 64 year age group in recent years, outweighing potential downward effects from population aging. The uptrend in participation may not be over. Participation rates exceed UK levels at most age groups <coughs> in a range of northern European countries. The female retirement age is still rising, and the concept of a fixed retirement age, for example, at 65 years, no longer applies. Adverse effects from population ageing are likely to continue to be balanced by the drop in the share of the adult population lacking secondary education. Moreover, low annuity rates and the prospective erosion of real wages from currency-induced inflation may pressure some people to work longer out of economic necessity. The next fact is inward migration. Official data on inflows of foreign workers to the UK uh, workforce are incomplete, but ONS data suggests that people born outside the UK accounted for more than a half of the growth in employment over the last five years and fully 95% of the last year's employment growth. Migration has complex effects on the labour market, complex deaths. Clearly, inflows expand labour supply, especially given that foreign workers generally integrate very effectively into the UK labour market. Unlike most other EU countries, foreign-born people in the UK have a similar jobless rate to UK-born people. But migration inflows also boost labour demand. The availability of foreign workers probably encourages firms to expand and invest in the UK. Increased employment boosts consumption and housing demand. Academic research suggests that migration inflows have not reduced overall UK wage levels, but may have depressed pay at the bottom end. However, most studies are focused just on the change in pay growth, rather than the change in pay growth for a given jobless rate and in the context of the demand boosting effects of migration. Research by Bentalila suggests that increased migration inflows have, have helped to shift the wage Phillips curve down in Spain. I, suggest, I suspect that the same has happened here. The attractions of working in the UK, which generally has high wage levels and low unemployment by UK norms, means that labour supply is expanded to meet demand with little upward pressure on pay. In particular, the greatest undershoots in pay growth relative to the jobless rates in recent years have been in regions with high migration inflows, such as London, the South East, East England and East Midlands. Prospects for inward migration to the UK in the next two to three years, especially from other EU countries, are uncertain. The lower pound may discourage inflows because it reduces UK pay levels in foreign currency terms, but the UK's high employment rate probably will remain a strong pull factor. Next factor is skills and regional mismatches. The high jobless rates of 20 and 30 years ago were exacerbated by the collapse of employment and manufacturing and construction in some regions, whereas job growth was concentrated in other sectors and other regions. Such mismatches limited the extent to which high unemployment dampened pay growth. This issue appears less acute now. The standard deviation of sectoral jobless rates is at a record low. Similarly, recent job growth has been slightly higher in regions with higher jobless rates, the opposite of the pattern seen in 1995 to 2007. Regional disparities in income levels remain high. But there's also tentative evidence of increased internal migration within the UK. For example, the numbers of people moving between local authority regions has risen to record highs in the last couple of years. This may reflect greater mobility among international migrants within the UK, 
Or it may be that with lower home ownership rates, it's less costly for people to move to another job. Final fact is public sector pay. Squeeze on public sector pay and jobs may also have capped private sector pay by reducing competition for labour. However, I have to note, it's actually quite hard to find a consistent effect for this over time. And in, in recent years, pay growth has not been particularly weak relative to the jobless rate in regions with a high share of public sector jobs, such as Wales and North East England. There may well be other factors at work, for example, self-fulfilling expectations for lower wage growth. I acknowledge that in some ways all of this is quite uncertain and imprecise. I suspect that the equilibrium jobless rate has fallen below 5%, but I'm not sure how far. Some of these factors could be consistent with a flatter Phillips curve, but the fact that pay growth has remained modest even with the jobless rate down to 48 suggests to me that the equilibrium is lower than previously as well. If you were to simply extrapolate the wage Phillips curve of 2011 to 16 with stable inflation expectations, then the jobless rate would need to fall to 4% or lower to lift pay growth to 4% year to year. I do not suggest that this is the most likely outcome. The Phillips curve may indeed be curved rather than a straight line. Currency induced inflation might lift um, inflation expectations sharply and the availability of migrant workers might decline sharply before and after Brexit. But it is also possible that Brexit-related uncertainties will reinforce other factors dampening pay, and that labour supply will expand as higher inflation erodes household spending power. My hunch is that underlying pay growth will probably stay comfortably below the 4% pre-crisis norm during the next few years, unless the economy is strong enough to pull unemployment significantly lower and or long-term inflation expectations rise markedly. To be sure, with modest productivity growth, the pace of wage growth consistent with the inflation target over time probably is lower than it used to be. But even so, labour cost growth in 2017 seems unlikely to me to pose major upside risks to the inflation target. In my view, this has several implications for monetary policymaker. First, comparisons of the jobs rate with historic norms or natural rate estimates may not be a totally reliable guide to labour market conditions at present. We should consider a range of indicators and acknowledge that estimates of the equilibrium jobless rate are somewhat fuzzy and may change in ways that cannot be fully understood or anticipated at the time. Second, there may now be more cyclical variation than before in insecure employment underemployment, participation and productivity, and less cyclical variation in unemployment. Slack may change even if the jobless rate is little changed. Third, monetary policy should not be set in a way that seeks to rule out sub-5% unemployment over time, unless we see clear evidence of markedly higher labour cost growth and or long-term inflation expectations, or the trade-off versus currency-driven inflation is much worse than expected. The economy might be able to run with lower unemployment than previously, consistent with the inflation target. But I stress, our target is for inflation, not unemployment. And fourth, a lower equilibrium jobless rate does not necessarily mean that it is appropriate to loosen policy further, nor would it rule out tightening. Sterling's recent depreciation will probably lift inflation above target this year, and economic growth recently has been stronger than expected rather than the rise in unemployment forecast in the November inflation report from the Bank of England, it seems quite possible to me that the jobless rate will stay below 5% this year. In considering the appropriate policy, I will be taking account of all of this, rather than just one part. Also, I want to stress the uncertainties. I'm conscious of historical episodes whereby overly optimistic assessments of slack were followed by a prolonged inflation pickup. If pay and other labour market guides give clear warning signs in coming months, then I might well have to revise my theory of a lower equilibrium jobless rate. This would probably have obvious implications for monetary policy, unless downside risks to economic growth rise significantly. Either way, the labour market data will probably be key guides to watch. Thanks very much for your time. Great, thank you, Michael. Feel free to, I should 
um, tell everyone that actually this lectern is basically a trick for most people. It is at a steep angle, in particular, a cold morning's hard <laughs> angle. So, the, um, so you did well, you passed the test, Michael. The, um, from now, the, um, there, there was a lot in that, and I mean a lot, and that is even from an organisation that likes charts a lot. The, um, uh, so let's just try and just step back to some of this big picture. But for a bit of history, the, the big picture in Britain over the last 15 years is of pay growth underperforming historical averages and, as shown very convincingly in those charts, uh, expectations since around 2002, both in terms of slow growth before the crisis and then catastrophic falls in pay during the crisis. That is our the history we're living with, the, um, and that's the background to lots of what uh, Michael is saying. Then uh, you're convincingly arguing, making a case there, Michael, for pessimism about future pay growth given given levels of labour market uh, slack, and for that pay pessimism being driven by structural shifts, not being driven just by productivity happens to have been low in uh, recent years. Now, what's the that's pessimistic. The, um, that might make us all worry about paying the bills, but it might at a macro level make us more relaxed about what the Bank of England and others need to do to respond to that, and it might make you all think that we can have more people in work and less people unemployed than we previously thought was normal. So that's kind of our, as a unfair and much shorter summary of what we are looking at. So for the panel, maybe give us their takes on how much you share that that pessimism about pay. The um, uh, and if so, should we care or should we be ecstatic that everyone's going to be uh, has a chance of being in work for a given uh, other all else? Um, Equal. And then you touched on at the end the impact of Brexit and particularly currency-induced um, inflation and how that interacts with um, pessimism about domestically pay-generated inflation. So hopefully we can return to that. Now, Laura, are you going to kick yep. us off with the first response? Yep. So um, I... Uh, on my journey into work this morning, I uh, it was a bit chilly, but actually really nice weather, quite sunny. So I thought, um, you know, why break the habit of a lifetime? Let's use weather uh, metaphors or similes to talk about the labour market. And then I got in and spoke to Torsten and uh, found out that where he'd come up from in London, the experience was completely different, storms and all that, which I think tells me a couple of things. And the first is that uh, Torsten always steals all of our best lines uh, by going first. And the I'm second is that uh, your individual experience really matters in terms of um, how you see uh, what's going on. So I was going to kind of extrapolate from the, the macro picture uh, we've, we've had from Michael and talk about um, from a living standards perspective, which is what we care about at uh, the Resolution Foundation, um, how I think uh, what the future holds is going to um, feel for certain uh, groups in the labour market. But to start with uh, the question I think uh, Torsten just posed, um, do we share the, the pessimism and the sort of analysis? And I think uh, broadly uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is based on our most recent earnings outlook that we published just before Christmas, which um, tracks a lot of the same indicators, particularly on slack and underemployment and things like that, that uh, Michael talked about. And that's so that's where all of this is coming from. And I think on the basis of that, we broadly do. Uh, we, we sort of did some rough calculations based on the latest OBR forecasts in this. And we think, you know, we could be at zero real pay growth as early as April, if you if you if you track the kind of monthly average weekly earnings series, which is data we'll be getting in June, um, so so that's kind of information we'll have in the first half of uh, next year. And it, and if and if we've always actually overestimated where where pay is going to be, uh, which is in recent years certainly one of the thing I, things I took from Michael's presentation, then that leads to even more pessimism still. Um, so this is going to be quite pessimistic, and then I'm going to try and end on something positive, um, which Sarah might uh, pick up a bit further. So, in so I'm going to talk about uh, three groups and what we expect for them. And the first is um, public sector employees, which uh, Michael mentioned, um, and uh, where that's going to go. And it, it, uh, I think it's been no surprise, given the overall policy on public sector pay restraint, that we've kind of expected public sector employees to do less well in terms of pay growth. But actually, that's taken quite a long time to feed through. And it was in uh, last year's pay data, the 2016 pay data, it kind of finally came through strongly with 3.6% uh, uh, real pay growth, hourly pay growth at the median in the private sector, 1.6% in the public sector. Now, uh, that's kind of consistent with what you think public sector pay restraint might be doing. But I do actually think it's really significant. We haven't had that discrepancy between the public and private sectors, uh, at least at any time in, um, well, that 
that discrepancy in terms of the public sector being lower, it's had periods of being quite a lot higher. We haven't had it underperforming the private sector at any time, at least in this century. So I think we expect that to continue going forward. What that tells us is that all the action we've been kind of talking about in a lot of the indicators we're tracking is basically in in the private sector in terms of what's going to happen, whether pay is going to under or overperform, that's what we're looking at. And I think this last year and this year is when that pay restraint really starts to bite and, and feel different, given that that gap is the widest it's ever been. So uh, I guess I'm saying I expect for the future, because we're trying to look to the future, more of the same in the public sector compared to 2016. Uh, the second thing I wanted to focus on in terms of different experiences for different groups in the loan market is the regional perspective. It's something we track a lot at the Resolution Foundation. I think you mentioned some signs of uh, regional convergence in some indicators, and we did get a bit of that in the uh, 2016 uh, ASH pay data with uh, Northern Ireland in particular, which had had a really, really poor uh, downturn, massive, biggest pay squeeze of all, having a, a strong year. Now, this is an area where I expect that to be a blip. Uh, and that's because a lot of the indicators we track that we believe are leading indicators of wage growth, lots of the things Michael talked about, things like um, underemployment, uh, long, things like long-term unemployment, um, levels of employee training, look really, really bad in Northern Ireland. And there's a there's kind of an interactive website sitting behind um, this four-page publication of I encourage you to go and have a look and click on the Northern Ireland lines. It's just all going in the wrong direction. So, for example, uh, on the eve of the downturn, Northern Ireland had the same long-term unemployment rate as the UK as a whole. It's now double. Uh, employee training is growing. It's in the page three of this in uh, pretty well in every region of the country. In Northern Ireland, it's zero. Northern Ireland had lower underemployment. The rest of the UK on the eve of the downturn now got significantly higher. So if these things do turn out to be leading indicators, I, I, I think things are going to look quite a lot worse there in particular next year in terms of pay growth. And we can maybe talk about how that relates to the different approach they've taken to things like active labour market policy, employment programmes and so forth, uh, potentially um, contributing to that slack. And the final group I was going to mention, uh, based on um, lots of the work we've been doing here, and in particular our new intergenerational commission that Torsten mentioned, is the experience of young people. Um, again, a bit like Northern Ireland, having had the sharpest pay squeeze in the downturn years, they had a good 2016. Um, but I think it's important to step back and think about how hard the experience of the last 10 years has hit, have hit them. So if you take, for example, uh, the cohort of young people born in... Uh, 1988, uh, who in the latest data are about 27, they have the same weekly pay as the 1968 cohort, born 20 years before them. And now, given that we expect each cohort to do better than the last, that is uh, a profound, a profound outcome. And uh, what's what the big question mark is for next year is to what extent, uh, given that your pay is supposed to mo grow most steeply in the early years of your career, those cohorts that have been unlucky to enter the labour market during the pro productivity slowdown and subsequent pay squeeze uh, experience some catch up to get back to the trajectory we, we might have expected for them. Now, the underlying signs on things like job mobility which is a really uh, strong driver of individual pay growth don't look great there falling before the downturn particularly off its uh, peak for young people so in terms of the mechanisms by which we think these uh, younger cohorts um, the millennials so far in the labour market are going to catch up I think it's an open question but there's enough structural signs there also on things like uh, returns to job tenure when they stay with firms that something has changed over the last 10 or 15 years and it's not just about the bad luck of of being in the of working during your 20s uh, during this um unprecedented pay squeeze we've had is the optimism coming <laughs> you promised you would say uh, i might run out of time for the optimism yeah, okay. let's get some optimism oh, yeah. um so to, yeah to conclude um uh, we're a living standards think tank. Uh, uh, if um, if what if what Michael says has le le led us to be to some extent less worried about the risk of inflation pressure, we should be, if anything, more worried about the risk to living standards, which some work we're publishing on a couple of weeks is going to bring together, bringing this labour market perspective together with uh, perspectives on employment and uh, what's going to happen to welfare 
um, benefits uh, to come to a view on incomes and uh, without giving too much weight, it's not that positive. So my, 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 end, my positive end point is uh, we should, uh, I think everybody's really negative about 2016 for lots of reasons, but we should, as we say on the back of this, be really positive. It was actually quite a good year for pay growth, uh, real pay growth, a lot down to low inflation. But the thing that was really, really good about it was the progressive nature of that pay growth. A lot of that's down to the introduction of the national living wage. Our analysis shows that that hourly pay, um, that ch change to hourly pay rates reduced hourly pay inequality, reduced weekly pay inequality twice as much, which is um, starting to get into a really strong feed through to living standards. And we know we're going to have a 5% increase in the national living wage in uh, less than four months' time. Uh, so there's lots of things to be quite pessimistic about. There's lots of groups we should wor be worried about, but I think we can be quite hawkish on, at least in the next year or two, what's going to happen in the low-paid part of the labour market. Great. And I think Sarah might that pick up that point a bit more. That was indeed optimism. At the end. So, so I can see a few civil servants in the room, so I'm sorry. Yeah, if there's any Northern Irish civil servants in the room, I'm really sorry. If there's any young Northern Ireland civil servants <laughs> hiding at the back, there'll be a helpline afterwards. Now, Sarah, go on, please go on some optimism. Um... Okay, this is this is sort of optimistic, depending on how you view the world. Um, I wanted to pick up on, first of all, I thought that was a fascinating speech, and um, I'm looking forward to going back and pouring through all of those charts, which included lots of things that I hadn't thought about. Um, but I wanted to pick up particularly on your point that when we wonder about this, which way does the causation go between pay and productivity, that actually there, there are quite a lot of good reasons to think that low pay growth has encouraged employers to choose a kind of high labour model over a kind of capital intensive model um, and that that has kind of given us a labour market that has very high levels of employment and a lot of people in work but a lot of them are in pretty crap jobs, low productivity, low skill, not much training. Um, I think that's definitely the story of what has been happening but I would argue that there are three things that might make us think that equilibrium could change quite dramatically in the next few years uh, and they're all basically policy policy decisions that the Conservative government has made. So the first one uh, is Brexit. Uh, Michael you referred to uh, this a little bit but there are quite a lot of studies that suggest that at least at the bottom end of the labour market in certain sectors in certain places uh, limitless um, EU migration has depressed wages or capped them from going up more. Um, and I met a farmer recently who said a lot of his kind of, he does carrots and stuff, and he said a lot of the um, farms that he knows in places like Norway, they just have machines doing all this stuff. But he said, there's no point in me getting machines. I've got, I can just get a truckload of people to come along. I pay them the minimum wage. They will, they will do it all super efficiently. I don't have to pay them when I don't need them. Um, so I think there has been something going on in some of these low-paid sectors whereby uh, productivity has been depressed because it's been so easy to get cheap, efficient, hard-working labour. Um, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen to um, our future migration policy, but it seems likely that it will be more restrictive Um and even now, I mean, we're already talking to some employers, things like food manufacturing, where they're already struggling to get people and they're thinking that they're going to have to put wages up because they just can't attract Romanians and Bulgarians anymore. They don't want to come. They don't like the sense of uncertainty. They don't like the sense that they're not wanted and they don't like the fact that the pound has plunged. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing to think about. How will that change the dynamics in the bottom end of the labour market? The second one Laura mentioned is the national living wage. Um, so at the same time, these all these sectors that are affected most heavily by Brexit are also the ones that are affected most heavily by the national living wage. So you've got these two forces coming at once. Uh, there's no sign yet that there's been any impact on employment levels. There's not really much sign there's been an impact on kind of investment in technology. But we're right at the start of this. Um, and if the government sticks to its guns by 2020, we'll have a national living wage that is 60% of median earnings. And that is the highest one of the highest in the OECD so that again kind of will be pushing employers to think more about machines over people um, and then the third thing that I would mention um, is that my initial one of my initial thoughts when the national living wage was announced was that a lot of the kind of benefits of that policy would kind of leak away via the kind of insecurity in the labour market that you talked about that actually I remember going to 
um, a briefing that some lawyers were giving to a bunch of small hotel owners. Uh, and they were, this was just before the introduction of the national living wage, and they were all panicking and saying, I don't think we can afford to pay our you know, chambermaids X more. And they said, well, look, here's something to think about. How many of your employees could actually be self-employed? Because then you don't have to pay them the national living wage. Um, and I thought to myself, mm, I wonder if one of the kind of slightly unfortunate side effects of this will be that there will actually be a kind of increase in things like bogus self-employment. Having said that, the Theresa May's government is very interested in this topic and has announced the Matthew Taylor review, um, which is specifically to try and get a handle on the sense that some of these benefits are leaking away. Again, we don't know what policies he will suggest, and we also don't know whether the government will take them up. But I think that there is a sense that actually this government wants to do something about that. And so I think those three policies together could, we could find ourselves in a place where we're in a different equilibrium, whereby maybe there are fewer jobs, maybe they're better jobs, maybe they're better paid jobs. And then we need to think about, is that is that an economy we would prefer or not? Because um, there are trade-offs there. And I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but that, that is what I would say. Great, and that was as close to optimism as we've got this morning, so thank you very much. The, um, the, and, uh, and it's definitely something, the, the idea that we're at a tipping point in what low-paid labour in Britain is for, I think is one we definitely share and see lots of policy and market driven. And actually, chief execs, you can tell, mm -hmm. yeah, not that they're hanging around in the low-paid part of the labour market, um, but you can definitely feel a flavour of end of an era of unlimited low skill, low pay, labour being available to us is underway. Although, I know one big counter-example, obviously, so the food manufacturing industry will expect to have um, the availability of temporary worker, low paid worker access after Brexit. They will, that's what they think they will get, they are probably right. The thing that has shocked me recently, talking to a few people, is people like the distribution sector think that they will have an availability of unlimited temporary worker access, at which point it starts to look like our migration system hasn't changed very much uh, at all. So someone is going to be shocked at some stage, either the British public or the British uh, employers. Paul. Okay, um, I'm a, a labour market analyst. I generally work around uh, microeconomic issues of individuals and groups in the way that Laura talked, but I'm going to break a habit of a lifetime here and do some macroeconomic discussions. What drives pay is three factors, which, which Michael all touched on. Uh, inflation, productivity and unemployment. The relationships between those three factors has always been contested. So the nature of the relationship between those and, 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 and pay growth has always been fairly contested. And then again, as Michael said, there is a distinct possibility that those relationships have shifted over the last 15 or 20 years and that there, you know, we are in a, in a different kind of space. So I just want to sort of discuss those kind of three factors and in particular sort of highlight that the next couple of years is going to tell us a lot about the nature of those relationships that we've had in a sense a series of shocks happening within the labour market which from which we are going to learn a lot about the nature of the relationships between pay, inflation, productivity and unemployment. Okay, so I'm going to start with inflation. So we roll back to the 1970s, the standard kind of Nehru model is the wages responded to price inflation. Yeah? If we had, as we did, oil price shocks which pushed up in inflation, an exogenous, if you like, outside UK push in inflation, wages responded, you had something like a wage price spiral, as wages also added to the inflationary pressure, which were broken only by attempts of the government to either constrain the wages in wages policies or through massive increases in unemployment in the early 1980s. Roll forward to this recession in the 2008, we had a major devaluation. We had a similarly large imported inflation shock from that devaluation, but wages didn't respond at all to that. Hence, real wages fell sharply. That raises a question, is that just about the response in a recession? Or are we now in a world where wage setting, if you like, is no longer a bargain between workers and firms, but it is something being set by employers based on what they can afford to pay, which doesn't reflect imported inflation at all. It's about because they aren't, in a sense, uh, benefiting in terms of revenues from imported inflation. 
if we are in that world and we have just had our second big devaluation. Yeah, we've just had a 12% post-Brexit devaluation. Given the size of the imports in our price kind of system, that would lead to a push of 4 to 5% on inflation over the next two or three years. We are in a situation then where if wages don't respond, we are going to have a wage squeeze, a period of wage stagnation. Right? If wages don't respond to that inflationary shock that's coming through the system. I note that the Bank of England, the Office of Budget Responsibility, and even to some even the Resolution Foundation are saying that that's what they expect. Yeah, that wages will not respond to the inflation shock, that we will have two to three years of wage stagnation, not falls this time because some of the other stuff is more positive than during the recession. Right, but we will see, if you like, if we are in a world where inflation shocks from outside the country no longer feed into wages. Right, that has a couple of implications which I just want to draw out. The first, I don't do monetary policy kind of stuff, particularly in this kind of audience. But if we don't have wages responding to external inflationary shocks, monetary policy setting gets a lot easier. Right? Inflation shocks, which are, inflation is only happening on a sustained basis on what's being generated within the UK in terms of wages and prices and so on. Right? But inflation shocks externally will just go through the system pretty quickly in a couple of years and we will go back to where we were before. They don't get embedded. Just, and you know, what's happening in the UK labour market, as was sort of indicated, will evolve more slowly. The job, you know, Michael's job is, gets a lot easier if we don't have a situation where prices and inflation embeds after external wage shocks. That's the smaller one of the two things, obviously. The more important one from my perspective is that it says that real wages are going to be a lot more volatile in the future than they have been in the past. Yeah? If we have inflation shocks in the future from devaluation or the reverse, if we have commodity price shocks of oil prices and so on feeding through into imported inflation, that is impacting on people's living standards fairly directly. People should be worrying about exchange rates not when they go on holiday in Florida or Spain. They should be worrying about exchange rates as their current living standards are going to be driven by the, what's happening in those kind of sectors. So wages, in a sense, are likely to be much more volatile than we've seen in the past. Not necessarily cyclical, because that's not the same thing as inflation shocks coming from outside, but we're going to see that kind of volatility. Okay, point one. Point two, productivity. As Michael alluded to, productivity and wages is a sort of, uh, uh, they're mutually linked. They reinforce each other. In good times, we have a sort of virtuous circle. Rising wages makes firms incentives to invest, to produce productivity, labor-saving productivity. That creates the revenues to generate uh, uh, rising living standards in the future. The extraordinary period that we had when wages fell that dramatically was turning that into reverse. The low wages was making labour more attractive, overinvestment, we've heard that kind of story, right? So what is the nature of that relationship and how sensitive are, is productivity to wage push? Well, we're going to learn something in the near future or about now. First, wage growth has returned, at least domestic wage growth. Uh, if wages at all respond to the price inflation shock we're going to have, that's going to increase further. Minimum wages, we know, are pushing up wages strongly at the bottom end of the labour market now and will do for the next few years. The pension auto enrolment system is adding to wage costs, particularly again for middle and low wage workers. And the training levy is adding another wage. We have got a big exogenous wage cost shock going on now. We will learn how much that feeds into productivity in the next couple of years. My hunch is, because I'm, this is my optimistic bit, right, <laughs> is the productivity will respond and that we will see returns to at least modest, you know, not 2% productivity, annual productivity growth, but certainly in the territory of sort of 1.5% is my hunch, right? If it doesn't happen, to put it in sort of uh, a building site language, we're screwed, <laughs> Right? Productivity is the source of rising living standards for all, including pensioners ultimately, yeah, because it provides the revenues for the state, it provides. If we are in a world of stagnant productivity for a sustained basis or anemic productivity growth, we are in, a, in an equilibrium of very slow rising living standards, which is deeply concerning and becomes, if you like, the dominant economic issue we need to discuss. Finally, unemployment. 
Okay, so um, uh, this is going to be a sort of fairly small point. The, the, the standard model which, which um, uh, Michael sort of put up there is unemployment drives wage growth. So if unemployment stays the same, it continues to have the same effect on wage growth year after year after year. Yeah, whatever level of unemployment that is at. The other model, which is sort of around there, is that wages, uh, so unemployment affects wage levels with some kind of dynamics. But in the difference between those two is they both say that if there's big changes in unemployment, you get changes in wages. But if unemployment regulates wage levels, not wage growth, unemployment which is old, unemployment falls, which were a long time ago, age out. They have less effect five, ten years after the unemployment fall than they do at the point at which unemployment falls rapidly. Right? Okay. If we look at the late nineteen, uh, the late two thousands period, we had at that kind of unusual period of sustained low unemployment. We haven't had that for a long time. Certainly, you know, back to the sixties. Right? In that period, actually, wage growth got rather anemic. It was the time when wage growth started slowing down. Right? I'm just putting out that as a sort of a, 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 a possibility. What it says is the unemployment falls were most marked in 2013-14. They are starting to get a bit old in, in the wage setting process. If unemployment is affecting wage growth, that's fine. It doesn't matter when it happened. If it's not, and there's some kind of dynamic process where the effects of unemployment age out, it uh, will diminish in its effect on wages in the next few years, three, four, five years out. The positive side of that is, what that says is, is you can drive unemployment low if you do it slowly. You can keep going for a long time, right, because it's a speed rule thing. If you do it too fast, you get inflationary pressures building in the economy through wages. If you do it slowly, the effects slowly age out, and the effects on wages and wage price spirals and stuff don't appear. It means that you can go a long way, which is sort of what Michael said, but slightly differently. But if you don't go too fast, right, that's me. Great. The, um, I, I, I'm not sure you get to count as optimistic, but you definitely had tinges of it in there right now. As, since we're in the process of admitting failed forecasts, I said 45 minutes of questions. I actually obviously meant half an hour due to classic overrun by British manufacturing, in this case, the panel. Right. So let's get some questions and we'll try and get you some answers. There's a gentleman right at the back. And Rob, do you want to come straight to the front here for this? Question? Okay, great. What was your name, sir? Um, it's a question about the contingency, uh, the rise of the contingency labour and, and the rise of the gig economy. Whether, whether you see that um, as uh, the, the growth in that um, continuing, um, and if you were to set up a recruitment agency tomorrow, um, where, which, whether you, you would set it up in the temporary market or in the permanent market, and which um, agency do you think will, will do well in the next year? Uh, that sounds like a request for investment advice <laughs> there at the end there. Is there anyone that is less like a male would like to ask a question? <laughs> no? Come on, Polly. You've got a question in you. No? Rejecting me? Right. There. Nope. There's a gentleman at the far back. There. Um, Hi, I'm Jonathan Slater from the Laundry Service Council. Um, I'd be very interested to hear kind of what your thoughts are about the apprenticeship levy, which is going to be in April, and what you think will be the longer term impacts on the uh, labour market. Great. Right, let's start with Jeff's question. So Jeff's question is, um, if what you care about is product, if you think that you can push up productivity by pushing up um, uh, wages, then shouldn't we be paying some attention to the demand side? This is the US argument circa 
nine months ago, the, um, which has now suddenly gone out of fashion on the left in America because Donald Trump's turned up and might be doing some of it. But anyway, but the, um, would anyone, um, I don't know, the, the, what is the bank's full position on demand that it's a given? Um, actually, I should add, right, I, when I talk, I talk for my own views, not nece- it's yeah. not necessarily a Bank of England thought of view. What is Michael Saunders' view? On right, it's, <laughs> it's the case for the speech, it's the case for all of those. Let me try to have a go at bits of all of those. Um, obviously, look, you, you would rather that the last six years has been strong real economic growth, stronger real growth, and stronger real growth of living standards. But an environment in which demand growth has been modest... Uh, there's a choice, right? You have low job growth or low pay growth, right? As, and collectively, as a society, we sort of ended up with low pay growth and quite good job growth. Well, you, you could imagine a world in which that mix was different. Uh, the question of which is better or worse, I think, is uh, it probably depends a bit as to where you sit. Um, but I think that's been a sort of case of using up the slack. Um, and maybe, in a sense, given the high costs of unemployment, social costs... Right, in a way, for the last few years, it's been better to use up the slack through jobs. Um, will contingent work continue to rise? I suspect so. Which agencies will do better? No idea. Sorry, I, I can't give you advice on that. Um, the effects of the apprenticeship levy... I mean, I, when, when I go around talking to companies, I hear bits of... Um, concern about this. By and large, what uh, the, the message which I'm getting though is that the rise in the national living wage, the apprenticeship levy, and all this sort of low end stuff, they're finding ways to absorb it um, rather than it feeding through into a significant increase in their overall labour costs and their, their prices. But as you said, uh, this is something which we'll learn much more about in the next few years. Great. Uh, Laura, an apprenticeship levy in particular, is anyone? Yeah, I was um, just going to add on Graham's question. Uh, I, d- I had no idea about why you should set up your business, but I think I'm kind of with Michael on, obviously not sure, but expect these kind of various kinds of what you might call insecure forms of work to keep growing. I think the interesting thing is kind of where next. So maybe it's just the evolution of our research, but you can... Uh, you can sort of go through when we were really focused on self-employment, uh, uh, really focused on zero hours contracts, really focused on you know tech-driven um, disaggregated work in the gig economy, and then most recently uncovering agency workers as maybe the new face of it. So I, th- I think that we could be talking about something next year that we don't even have a word for yet or in two years' time. Um, and the interesting thing about that in some work we published over Christmas is the impact on living standards deriving not just from the uh, variability in hours or contracts that those forms of work entail but in lower hourly pay levels controlling for characteristics so um, a, a direct impact on pay as well as a volatility impact. On the apprenticeship levy Again, I think I'm broadly with uh, Michael. Our kind of hunch in some of our full employment work was not necessarily the risk that it uh, weighed heavily on pay bills, but that it didn't really do very much because with the apprenticeship target, uh, most a lot of employers were thinking about how they could turn current employees into apprentices without necessarily... Uh, offering opportunities to young or low-skilled people or people recently out of education or rebrand training they're already doing so it looks enough like an apprenticeship that it ticks the box uh so that you know from a from an upskilling perspective and a giving opportunities to largely young people coming out of the vocational system your concern might be in the other direction that it's it's not forcing employers to change their behavior enough sarah um so on the gig economy, I mean, definitely all of the the, the economic trends point towards um, that growing and contingent work growing. But just it's worth bearing in mind that you are starting to see a policy pushback against some of this stuff. And we don't know how strong that will be. But um, if I was setting up an agency that dealt with, you know, self-employed people, I would be slightly nervous of the fact that um, there are a lot of policymakers now thinking quite hard about whether this is something that they want and if it's not, what to do about it and maybe how to make it more difficult. Um, and on the apprenticeship levy, I mean, in I think Laura's right. There is, there is a school of thought that says um, that part of the reason that 
employers have kind of underinvested in training, particularly for young people, is that they had they have had access to um, very skilled workers from abroad that they didn't need to train themselves. Um, so again, you know, post Brexit, you can you can see a scenario in which companies might think, God, actually, we really need to start training some native born workers. And given there's this apprenticeship levy, this might be a smart way to do it. That's the kind of optimists case. Um, having said that, I think, you know, the risk of this sort of rebadging, rebranding issue is a is a real one. And because for an employer, like the money gets taken away from you and then you, you get it back in these vouchers. And the easiest way to, to spend the vouchers is a small number of expensive apprenticeships. Um, and the, the small number of, of expensive ones would be like, let's put all of our managers on a year long training course rather than let's go out and hire a load of not very skilled young people. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that is the risk. Paul, do you want to I'm follow up with the demand question in particular? We've yeah, I'll, come back on. I'll, I'll say something about that but, but slightly obliquely. Um, um, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, one of the things that we've really learnt over the last few years is that minimum wages can be moved a long way before they start having any significant employment effects. And we actually don't know at what point that is yet going to be the case. Uh, we've got a big push coming still, and in America we've seen these kind of campaigns for $15 and some large increases in, in, in minimum wages. And again, where they've been coming in, we haven't seen major employment effects. Right? So partly that uh, maybe getting profits, we see some evidence that there is some kind of effects on profits and firms are affected. It's clearly affecting prices to some degree. Right? But there is also evidence that part of the reason that it doesn't have as bad effects as people once would have said is that it's affecting the local demand, that it's, it's feeding into the economy yeah, uh, in positive ways. Right? So uh, it's, not, it's a bit of bleak about the demand side, but in a sense that there is a positive story, which is that there is a lot of capacity. We have learned, and there may still have a long way to go, there's a lot of capacity for wages to rise at the bottom end without adverse economic effects. Right? That's kind of a big lesson over the last few years. On the, on the other two points, I just want to touch on the self-employment one. Um, it used to be sort of accepted that the self-employed didn't pay the kind of nicks which the employer and the employee would be paying if they were in an employment relationship because the self-employed didn't receive the same kind of benefits, right? They didn't receive the same kind of pension entitlements. They didn't receive contributory availability of contributory of JSA and equipment and things like that. Changes in the welfare system mean that's much less true than used to be the case. Tax credits, the self-employed are quite good at milking the tax credit system. Pensions have become effectively universal, right? So the case, if you like, for the self-employed being exempted from the equivalent of employer NICs has, in my view, diminished. What it's indicating, it is quite tax efficient for firms to use people as self-employed and it's not necessarily tax inefficient for the self-employed person themselves, particularly if they under-record income. Uh, and the state is the big loser out of this, right? And part of the policy interest that's coming out is because of that. The state is the big loser out of this. There isn't the revenues coming out of it, and that is deeply worrying and needs to be addressed. And much of the argument in favour of lower tax treatment, particularly in next self-employed, in my view, has diminished and could diminish further. You could also enrol them in a pension system. Yeah, a compulsory saving type system. Fine. Right. Finally, uh, apprenticeships. A again, slightly sort of slightly different take. Um, firms get lots of tax incentives and write-offs, which I don't fully understand when they're engaging in various forms of capital type investment, R and D, tax credits, etc., etc., etc. We haven't treated human capital investments in the same way. The apprenticeship levy is the first step in that way of thinking. Yeah is that there are, ta you know, it's, it's becoming incentivized to do the training because you have to pay for it anyway, yeah? And I just think there may be a bit more mileage in that kind of way of thinking. That we should be thinking about how to incentivize in the parallel ways as we do with capital and research and development in training and skill-based training. Uh, and that, you know, hopefully is positive. The difficult bit is whether you can actually 
make sure that it feeds into people's wages. It should do, but you know there is an issue there as to where the capture of it is uh, if, if you're doing it as a policy to tackle just about managing families or whatever. Okay, great. Probably our, our policy attempts to drive up capital investment obviously haven't actually done that well. Yeah, so it's yeah. not really got worked, but we haven't done it. That's at least true. But in the interest of we're a customer service organisation, so you asked a question about where to invest. Here's my advice to you, given no one's given you some investment advice. Go to Birmingham and set it up there. Because the largest growth in um, uh, employment in Birmingham since the financial crisis is in temporary uh, work. So it's not a sector, but it's a place. And there are other plus sides to the West Midlands. I can't think of them right now, but there are some. <laughs> now, the, uh, let's, Polly's going to have a question. So a woman is going to ask a question. This is a big breakthrough right next to you. And then another one here as well. Thank Who's, you where's you the other? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great question. You're not allowed to answer yet, Paul. No. Sue? Uh, Sue, uh, I just want to ask Michael to elaborate on his comments on inward migration. I know you say the impact of the Brexit is very uncertain, but what do you think would happen to sort of Sarah's and I do have this farmer and his carrot workers if the government was to succeed in reducing immigration into the UK? I mean, do you think these workers would give his British workers a pay rise if the finally would he invest in them? You will be there are no British workers picking carrots in Britain today, just as a, whether that's good or bad. Thanks very much. Um, taking a crap from Citizens Advice. Sarah's already mentioned, obviously, the National Tenure Review, um, and there's been sort of quite a few various government moves at the moment looking at um, issues in the labour market. Um, one of the things we've been looking at at Citizens Advice also is the role of employers. Um, so I'd just be interested in any thoughts from the panel on how to strike that balance as to where it should lie, uh, the responsibility of government, the responsibility of employers, um, to make sure that you know we have, we have a, a you know a, a labour market that's, that's fair and all. Res responsibility for. Sorry. Responsibility for what? Um, sort of, you know, improving sort of fairness in the labour market and addressing who should do it. Uh, so Okay. Great. Paul, Polly was nudging at you in her first um, question. I, I, mean, I think we can be reasonably confident that if you do a clamp down and start, in a sense, imposing more costs on a package associated with self-employment, a chunk of that will go into employment relationships. Right? Not all of it, uh, by any means, or all of the recent increase. Some of that increase in self-employment recently does reflect lifestyle choice, particularly amongst older professional people who are using it to sort of a part retirement, doing some consultancy and quite enjoying themselves in the process. But it's the bottom end of the labour market's growth of self-employment we're talking about here. So I think it will have a big effect on the extent of the boundary between employment and self-employment. Does it have a, that will in itself generate revenues for the government, which is why they're interested in it? I think that's re I'm reasonably confident there. Will it have adverse knock-on effects in any kind of way? In a sense, what it's doing is increasing the bite of the minimum wage. It's a bit like there's sort of minimum wages going up, but there's leakage going on as, as groups are sort of exempted from it. Yeah, in the bottom end of the labour market. So you're, it's a bit like another minimum wage increase, but it's not for everybody. It's for some some groups who are sort of nudging out the side, wind side of the minimum wage increase. As yet, we haven't seen any kind of adverse economic effects from that kind of behaviour. So on the margins we're talking about, no, I don't see any kind of long-term economic damaging type effects from that kind of stuff. All of us, I think, are saying two things. One, there must be a limit to how high minimum wages can go. And there are other costs, right? We are moving towards something like 20% of the workforce being on, a, on the same wage rate. That does affect promotion incentives to, you know to move up you know fat pay structures there's some costs coming right but in a sense they're not employment costs they're about pay progression and uh, workplace organization and that kind of stuff we could be heading towards like you know one wage towns and you know McClunkliffe. <laughs> Well, it, it, for that kind of reason, in the sense you're losing one of the sorting systems for which people move into better paying, higher status, more productive jobs. You need yeah. straight, probably straight incentives for people to want to get promoted when the promotion is at only 25p an hour. 
and they take on extra responsibility. And they already in focus groups say they don't want it. And at some point, that's not great for the uh, economy. Look, let's be quick on our answers now, because otherwise you can get a very own question. Uh, immigration? Sue's question? Uh, I, I don't know as to what firms would. I, I, I'm not even sure as to whether inward migration in the next two to three years and the run-up to Brexit increases or decreases. Um, and I, I, I think that research suggests, as I said, that firms, that inward migration is cap pay at the bottom end. Let's take, for the sake of argument, assume that labour supply does decrease. Then logically you'd think that either firms would pay more or maybe they would do capex and employ less people, or maybe some firms would cease doing things, or maybe prices would rise, or some combination. There may be other things, and I genuinely don't know as to which of those or other things would be the most likely outcome. Great. And do you want to touch briefly on your view on the role of firms in taking up doing some of this fairness improving? Sarah? You seeing any of it going on? What, firms taking responsibility for yes. fairness? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Um, it's easy when, uh, you know, Vicky and I both spend a lot of time uh, looking at sharp practices in the labour market, and it's easy to forget that actually the vast majority of employers are pretty decent and want to do the right thing. So, I mean, I, I don't think um, we should assume that every employer is out to kind of um, screw over their workers. Uh, that said, you know, I think I think there's a role for the government and this creation of a kind of labour market enforcement guy seems like a move in the right direction um because the weird thing about the uk is that there is no enforcement really of labor market rules <clears throat> the only way they're enforced is through people going to employment tribunals and the government has made that much more expensive and so like all employment tribunals have fallen off a cliff and if that's your only real check on sharp practice then that's a problem um so i think that's for the government to sort out yeah, I mean, just Becky, just come at this another way. One of the weird, one of the one of the good things that should be happening to our debate about our labour market now is we need to move. We should be moving away slightly from a world which is asking what is going on in our labour market to asking what do we want it to look like, and um, particularly on self-employment. If I just reflect back on the last fifteen years of labour market discussions and economic policy making in Britain, we have been too neutral about what we actually want. And we are, I personally, I think we're probably heading towards levels of self-employment now where, because it is very bad for productivity, and it is also quite bad for the tax... I mean, I, 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 was, I was a true civil servant, so I've got kind of problems, uh, but I don't like the level of public finance hit that is coming from that. The, the public, we've got a public discussion about the level of self-employment we want in this country, and it's not all... There are lots of people having a great time doing self-employment, but we incentivise it heavily in Britain. The growth is huge. It is not the same across the entire world. We are ex we're exceptional in the size of our growth, although it's grown elsewhere. We're going to have to start asking, is that level what we want? Is it good collectively, even if it's good for all individuals and for the firms that use that labour? Right, let's get one more round of questions, and then people can be released to the cold weather. Question right at the back, gentlemen, and then Rob, there's a, there's a lady just here as well in the middle. You should stop it. You should stop it. <laughs> Okay. Um, Sarah Mackin from Airbus, a very similar question actually. Um, I, what, again, on the policy mix, um, so we're a company that's obviously invested a lot in productivity and employment. Um, I've been quite surprised at the pessimism this morning. Um, you could say low in unemployment is very good. Where should the priorities be given the challenges of perhaps uh, the other markets, the other parts of the economy? Should the government prioritise productivity training over putting money into people's pockets, which are more generalised tax cuts? Okay, great question. Let's have one more, and for the sake of speed, the gentleman just right at the front, Rob. I think. Um, James Lowe from Metro Strategy. I'm interested that no one on the panel has mentioned the increase in part time work because <coughs> the really big change to government finances, which has been touched upon, is the payment of benefits to people who are in work. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the, the big increases in work, they're all coming at the low end where people don't care that much about what they're paid because they're, they're getting most of their income, vast of their income from these benefits, but I'm interested to know what, given the brief amount of time, they will do, they call that um, in-work benefits and part-time on that into their discussion. And by the way, I believe that uh, self-employment is actually the fastest growth productivity area in the entire economy. 
For lowest level. Mm. It's a very low level productivity. Right. The, um, uh, that's worth getting. Let's get into those. Then, do you want to start on the big policy mix questions of those two? Sure. Look, um, if you accept that for a given jobless rate, pay growth is lower, and I take your point, we're not sure as to whether it's levels or growth rates, but if you just accept that as a premise, um, to me the implication is, well, in that case, long run, given that monetary policy is anchored by a flexible inflation target, we should be able to have a lower jobless rate than previously. It's not that we end up with permanently lower pay growth, right? We end up with lower unemployment. Right? So that, to me, right, a change in the mix between the jobless rate and pay growth is probably, it has this encouraging long-run implication. Right? You, you know from loads of evidence that the social and financial costs of unemployment are very high, both for the economy as a whole and particularly for the people involved. Right? And one of the striking features of the recent recession is it has left much less scarring in that sense in terms of high long-term jobless rates than previously. Right? And you know, that, that, that's something which, which is worth noting. Um, on the effects of part-time work, I do think this is an important part of uh, the increase in labour market flexibility. I think it's in, 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 partic in particular has been an important part of the rise in participation rates. One of the things which I've been struck by on company visits is the way in which firms are using new technology to make it easier for part-timers to vary their hours or for firms to vary the amount of hours that they want part-timers to work. And that makes the transition the sort of bound between inactivity and employment to be much more flexible in a way with which quite a lot of people find quite helpful. Right. Is there any general wrap-up question points you want to make before this is our last chance to speak to this audience? Is there anything else you want to add before we let the others eat? Um, I've You've said quite a lot of it. No, no, I, I thank you all for coming and for your questions. And if you have any more things which you're wondering about this, or there's some burning question, you think, <laughs> what about this? Then email me. Now my, my email address is. Oh my god, this is very open. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, this is, I didn't uh, say first phone, time anybody email. in the Bank of England has ever said, turn up, come for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. Tea and biscuits. <laughs> Tea and biscuits. <laughs> um, just to pick up on the part time point, which I think is a, a good one, I don't know if you saw the IFS put out some research yesterday looking at uh, a really steep rise in low paid part time men of kind of prime age, um, which I think does speak to this participation point. Um, the other thing to think about policy mix wise that that just occurred to me is um, no one's really talked about universal credit, but uh, a lot of these things, self-employment, part-time work, progression, uh, will potentially be massively affected by universal credit if and when it actually happens. Um, and I think thinking about some of the policy intersections, like between the national living wage, which is going to compress uh, wage differentials, and a universal credit system, which tells people that they have to ask for more hours or more pay, uh, is going to be quite interesting and potentially a bit problematic. Paul? OK. Um... OK, and just on this kind of putting the pessimism kind of stuff, if you were asking, if we were doing this last year, I was pretty optimistic, yeah. Because the strong employment growth had been incredibly progressive in raising employment in, in uh, low-income households. Wage growth was returning, right? And I was expecting, you know, and to some, some extent been realised, that the productivity uh, drought would start to ease, right? It might not be boosting, you know, booming, but it would start to ease. How have things sort of changed in the last year? Well, in a sense, I still think that world is, is what's coming. But I think it has been delayed by two or three years because the inflation push is going to erode real wages over the next couple of years unless, as we discussed, wages can respond to this inflation shock coming from the post-Brexit devaluation. So I, you know, in that sense, I think we are in a world where, if you like, it's, it's jammed but it's delayed, yeah, uh, is, is kind of sort of my position. Uh, in terms of the kind of priorities, uh, employment growth has been incredibly beneficial. Uh, as, as alluded to. Uh, wages at the bottom have been rising incredibly rapidly in the last couple of years, partly through minimum wages. That's incredibly positive. But the longer run challenge has to be productivity. Yeah? If we can't get that moving, I mean, I'm optimistic. I think it's going to move now. If that doesn't come to the case, that has to be the number one policy priority because if we aren't getting productivity gains in the economy, you just aren't getting rising to the extent. Okay. Um, 
Great. They, um, oh, I was going to say something about like tax credits. Sorry. I mean, um, uh, this is the first Resolution Foundation event where anyone's ever used the phrase, we haven't really talked about universal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, And it will be the last. Yeah, go on. Okay. Yeah, go on, so you might as well. Let's roll back, you know, when sort of tax credits and the, and the extended support of low wage work through, through the tax and benefit system that came in, we had something like one in five households, working age households, with nobody in work. You know, one in five kids was living in a household where nobody worked, and they often lived in households where nobody worked for sustained periods of time. That has been a revolution over the last 20 years. We're now down to one in 10, yeah, and it's falling rapidly. And the big increases in employment have been part-time, but it's been second earners and big, big rises in employment of low parents. Yet it's gone from under 40% to, to six, over 65 in, in an incredibly short period of time. That's the positive side. The negative side is kind of alluded to, it's costing the revenues and it may have effects on behaviours. Final point on it though is the universal credit changes that are coming in are reducing the value of tax credits for those people who are just entering the labour market. Yeah, the, the work allowance erosion relative to the, often it's often, the initial design is the big uh, saving in terms of the expenditure, but it's the most damaging thing that you could possibly do. Yeah, and then recently they cut the, the taper rate by a little bit rather than introducing also raising the work allowance. That's that's just the wrong way around. Yeah, you want to get people into work. Yeah, through the work allowance, making work attractive to tackle the worklessness and so on. That's the kind of priority. Uh, but that seems to have been the area where they chivied away most aggressively in terms of trying to make the savings. And I just think that's the wrong place. Great. Laura, last one. Very quickly, I think um, kind of linking James's point to Sarah's, um, uh, the yes, we probably haven't been opti optimistic en enough, Sarah, about um, the preference for, put crudely, lots of people earning a little bit versus very high unemployment, meaning quite a few don't earn anything at all. And you can link the growth in part-time work in recent years partly into that. So if work, if that is another mechanism by w which work has become spread out a bit more, then that's probably a good thing for living standards, both in that period and in the future, if you believe that long periods out of the labour market cause scarring and, make, and can entrench worklessness and so forth. And the other thing to say on part-time work is... Um, we, we might have negative views on it, but as Paul mentioned, it's been a really big success story in terms of participation of sec women, second earners and single parents in uh, particular. If we think about the challenges for the coming years and uh, kind of going back to our intergenerational work, we've got very large size-wise cohorts of um, older workers approaching uh, retirement age and a real fiscal imperative to try and uh, encourage um, working into old ages for as long as possible. So if we can, and, and a lot of that when you get to those ages is connected to combining work with the challenges of a health problem. So if we celebrate the success we've had partly through opportunities to work part time and what the welfare state uh, benefits in work benefit system has done to support that over the past 20 years, how that can be brought, how that success can be transferred over to policy on supporting older working and particularly working with disabilities around things like flex positive flexibility and part-time working is going to be key to the fiscal challenge and all, all sorts of other challenges in terms of the demographics of uh, population change, intergenerational issues in the next 10, 20 years. Great, thank you, Laura. Right, look, I'm going to wrap up. We've all got busy lives to get on to. I just want to say thank you, first of all, to um, Michael. Let's give him a round of applause for coming and giving us a lot of... And if, if there's, um, there's quite a lot in that slide pack, which unless you are superhuman, that's worth dwelling on at a longer uh, time period that we'll actually be coming back to as well. So we should say thank you to the panel as well for moderate optimism. <laughs> moderate. They, um, they, and thank you for you all coming when it's particularly cold, but a world of warning in the forecast world. I predict a double dip. The temperatures are going to fall this afternoon. You must wrap up warm and stay safe. See you all soon. <laughs>